What's up guys, it is Elk Week. We bring you a brand new video every single day on everything elk. All right, so we are giving over $7,000 of gear away, everything that you need for hunting elk this fall. So there is no purchase required to enter into this giveaway. All you have to do is click the link below and follow the prompts. So every single day this week at four o'clock, we're dropping a new video. So make sure you get in and into those giveaways. All right guys, welcome back to Elk Week here. Today we're with Onyx Specialists. Can I call you a specialist? I'll take that. I'll take it. <laughs> we're here with our next specialist, Dylan. He's gonna. We're gonna break down how to e scout for elk on OTC public land. Um, however, you want to do that. Figuring out how to break down those barriers of coming out west, possibly, and going on your own elk hunt and having the confidence to do that. So that's that's the big thing about this whole elk week that we've kind of been touching on quite a bit. It's just, you know, I, I've never hunted elk before. I really, really want to get into it, but I don't know how. Hopefully after you guys watch this week, hopefully it will kind of answer a lot of the questions to make you guys feel more comfortable. They come out west. Let's talk about this, Dylan. Um, what's the first thing they're going to do as far as like, where do I go, right? Yeah, and that's really, you know, starting with getting a tag, right? That's for, for some of us in the west, I've always lived in Montana to myself. I can get an elk tag every year. I am super, you know, blessed and spoiled when it comes to that. Not a lot of people are in the same boat, especially if you don't live out west. So it all starts with getting a tag. Some states are easier than than others. Obviously, some states, i.e. Colorado, some of those over-the-counter opportunities have recently gone away. And it doesn't seem like there's getting more opportunities, right? They're there's some opportunities out there and they're getting harder and harder to draw those tags or to find those over-the-counter hunts. So again, it kind of starts with, with getting a tag and our bread and butter, our expertise on X's is maps, right? We, we know what our expertise is. We want to stay in that lane, but we work with some of the best folks in the industry on the back end, building some really cool tools to help folks get tags, whether it's elk tags or deer tags or you name it, right? But uh, we realize you can't utilize our maps out in the field if you don't have a tag in your pocket. So in order to do that, all elite members, you have a free digital membership to Hunt and Fool. Hunt and Fool is the best in the business. I first, before I call them, take out a pad and a pen of paper because I'm gonna have so much knowledge and information that I want to remember. So you get a free digital subscription through um, Hunt and Fool as being part of the on X member. And what that's going to do is that's going to give you um, really good insight as far as, okay, I want to hunt Wyoming. Well, here's the deadline. Here's the cost as a non-resident. Here's what it looks like. Here's some preferred units, just the, the whole structure. Because if anybody's looked into it, every single state is so different. Even your own home state is subject to change. And I have to read the regulations. It feels like I'm like a lawyer reading, you know, pages of, of, lawyer verbiage every single year um because there's so many changes and nuances so it breaks down all of that and as somebody who hasn't hunted quite a few states still if i read through one of those sections i've got a very very good solid understanding of here's what it's going to cost me here's what i need to know here's what we need to know if we're going to apply as a party if trent and i want to go out and hunt colorado together right so that's really the the base of it. The one that comes to mind right now is the big, you know, everybody's talking about Colorado going away from the over the counter thing, you know, and so, and that's a big thing as far as, you know, a change in the whole system, whereas like Hunt and Fool, like they know the system inside and out as it changes and they can help you out with that too. Exactly. And so we've got hunt research tools, which will give you some draw odds, you know, also the season dates and so on and so forth which is a really cool tool. But what I wanna show right here while we're talking through some of this is how to get that. So same thing on your phone, you can access this, but from the computer, as you're looking at the map here, um, over on the left-hand side, I'm gonna to go to Elite Pro Deals, View All Elite Deals, so I can scroll down and see some of them here. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and go to View All Elite, and it's just gonna open up a new tab. As part of the Elite membership, you have access to some really cool stuff. Born and raised call co, 20% off calls, um, Hunt and Fool is, is the one that I was referring to here. So if you go ahead and click in there, you can redeem that. A lot more information about what that is. So Hunt and Fool is one of them. The Hunt Research Tools, which is everything you need to know for draw odds. And then the third piece of the puzzle for application season is Hunt Reminder. So Hunt Reminder is going to give you a notification set to your phone. I can go into Hunt Reminder and I can say, hey, I am interested in Colorado mule deer, Colorado elk, Wyoming elk, and New Mexico antelope, right? So what, with Hunt Reminder, what that's going to do is that is going to give me a text message to my phone and an email. I can set up preferences. Do I want a text? Do I want an email? 
It's going to say, hey, application season for Colorado elk is now open. That reminds me to get on the horn. I'll also get uh, another reminder with like a week left, for example. I'll get a notification to my phone and an email saying, hey, you have one week left to apply for Colorado elk. Make sure you don't miss out. Then the last chance, hey, final hours. So really, there's no good excuse anymore for missed application deadlines. I've been there. You've been there. We've all been there, right? It's hard to We've been there. juggle all of those, especially when you do multiple states. So uh, no good reason anymore for that. And then again, Hunt, Re Hunt Research Tools is a tool that we personally built that is going to, um, you can also find it over here on the right-hand side. It's going to uh, give you draw odds for each one of those. So very long-winded way of saying, I know we've got a lot to cover here, but you got to start with a tag. If you don't have a tag, you can't go hunting, right? And unfortunately, yeah, yeah. we live in a, a day and age where getting a tag is harder. So you have to be on the ball with this information and with these deadlines. And if you miss a deadline, if you don't, if you're like, oh, I don't need to set up the hunt reminder, I'll remember and you miss that deadline. Well, that could set you back multiple years. years it's yeah, not just setting yeah. you back one year because now you're behind the points curve. Um, so that can really mess up your plans or maybe now after going toward a sought after hunt, you know, you're like, well, I'm just going to take what I can get and hopefully I find a, a legal bull, right? Which is no shame in that. But you, you've you got to be on it with the, the tags and the applications, especially if you don't live in the West. Yeah, 100%. Once you get that tag, the things that I want to focus on the most is the people that, okay, I've done my research. I've got the tag. I'm, I got a tag in Northern Idaho. Let's talk about oh, Northern Idaho. How about that? So here's where I'd start. Obviously, as you can see, I've got Montana pulled up. So, you know, you might have your home state pulled up. Maybe it's Iowa, Florida, you know, wherever you live. If you're coming out west and you're interested in Idaho, um, I just need to go down here and turn on Idaho. It's literally that simple. Now Idaho is turned on. You can see the game management units. I'm going to go ahead and remove Montana just so you can see the, the border a little easier there. So it's literally that simple to get information on your map. It's like two clicks, whether, and all of this we're showing on the, the desktop version. Everything on your phone is the exact same. So I'm gonna go ahead and go into Idaho here. The first thing that I always do, because you never know with each state, especially again, if you're not accustomed to the state, I'm gonna to go to the game management units. So go to that layer right here, Idaho GMUs. I'm gonna to go to details. So Idaho is one of these states that has a whole bunch of different game management units. So if I click on Sandhill Crane units, there's not much going on in Idaho, you can see. Um, so definitely make sure, you know, we're, we're talking elk here, make sure you are That's on the right, you know, management unit, especially as you're looking at tags, because it can be really confusing to see, look at the elk regulations for Idaho and see whatever, you know, 20 options, for example. And then you look at your map and you're like, what is going on here? You know, maybe you've got bear units or deer units or something. And it's just much different, right? Some states all of these are the same. They've got one game management unit and it doesn't yeah. matter if you're hunting mountain goat, bighorn sheep or elk, right? Um, Idaho is not that state. So start by making sure you've got the right game management units turned on. Um, and so really I, I prefer to like get the layers dialed before I really dive into the map. Um, so starting with that one, I mean, we'll leave private public lands turned on. That's pretty easy. Possible access. Again, every state's gonna be a little bit different. Possible access tells me that it might be a big timber company that owns that plot of land, right? So it, it will show as private, but it's treated as public land, most of them. You still have to do your, your due diligence and your research. Um, but if you are looking at areas that have possible access and your neighbor is gonna go hunt the same area and they are not, they're automatically thinking that's private because it is private land but it is publicly accessible most of the time with some research. So that does open up some, some, yeah, some really cool opportunities. And so all of this land right here, um, all of this polka dot green stuff, if I turn that off, it goes away. Now I'm looking at, okay, I've got some public on the right. I've got some state or some other public land, but there's a lot of private through here. Well, if I turn that on now, it's like, okay, now we're talking, I've got a lot more access to work with here. Again, do your research. It doesn't mean guaranteed you can go hunt it, but it's a very good starting point to look into a few things and says, yep, open to hunting or public access year round, you're good to go. Um, some of them in Oregon, correct with this, you you have to apply for or like pay for. Pay for. 
Yeah, so that's going to be your private timber land. So, and, and same with like where you're looking at there in Idaho, there's a lot of timber cutting and stuff like that there too. And yes, where we're from, it's like there's a lot of timber companies, you know, especially in the September months, they'll allow access depending on fire danger, depending on a lot of different things. So know those things. But what, what, what that gives you the benefit of is it'll say the name of the exact company that you need to call and then call them and say, hey, I'm looking to hunt up on juniper creek or whatever um is that is that okay you know and so obviously call before you just step in the land but that at least gives you an idea uh without saying no right off the bat right yep exactly so next one down is another huge access kind of a cheat code for those that know it and a really like detriment to those who don't um so again every state's different montana's is called block management Essentially, yeah. what that is is just land that is privatized, but it's working either with the state or most of the time it's the states individually, but working with an agency to open it up for public opportunity. A lot of times they will be incentivized um, dollar wise, so they'll get kickbacks or whatnot to be able to do that. So, um, Idaho access, yes. So, again, here, all this is private. I'm scrolling around on the map trying to come out for the first time. It looks like private. Now I turn this on and it's like, okay, might be able to access this country. If you click on it too, and this isn't just for this particular layer, anything on the map, if you click on it, it will give you more information based on what you have uh, pulled up. So elk management zones, um, let's see if I can find, so Idaho private lands, you got tax address. Sometimes, so here you go, here it is, Idaho access, yes visit more so this is the name of the access species big game upwind etc cetera, etc cetera. i can click this and if it's open um, it will give me more information a lot of these are seasonal so montana's are not currently active as we speak but it will give you all of the rules and regulations some of them in montana for example you can just sign in on a sign in box and go hunting um, get there extra early sign your name in your license plate of your pickup and take off some of them are a little bit harder to get on and you have to treat it as like a lotto system, for example. Um, those ones are, as I said, a little harder to get on, but if you get on them, they're pretty cool. It's kind of like you're hunting private that doesn't really get hunted much, right? We've got current conditions. If I am doing some e-scouting coming out here in the next month, there's going to be a lot of active wildfires. I'm going to make want to make sure that I've got that layer turned on. So as I zoom out, you can see Idaho is actually pretty good with fires right now. There's a few over in Washington, Oregon, um, but there's an active yeah. fire over here. So it's just a good thing to know of, hey, I'm, I'm making my last minute plans. I'm gonna check on X for active wildfires. If I was planning on, if my hunt was next week and I was planning on going into this drainage and camping up on this ridge, probably you gotta find a plan B at this point because this whole thing right now is on fire and it, this is updated daily. Um, so it's kind of a cool, cool helpful thing. helpful thing so before onyx had that lair this has been years ago but uh we went to colorado and had the spot all picked out already east scouted it did everything we needed we showed up and we got within 10 miles and it was closed the road was closed and they said uh there's a wildfire right on the other side of the mountain that we wanted to hunt absolutely not so we had to change our plans right off the bat so that could be huge huge helpful yeah definitely expect you know for us, it's one thing if I drive an hour to a spot and there's a, a closure or something, it's annoying, right? It might ruin a morning hunt, but if you're driving across multiple state lines and you don't have backups and backups to those backups, like it's going to put yeah. you in a bind and it's not going to be a good start to your trip. That was a 26 hour drive. No big deal. So we also have some, some drought data as well. You know, definitely I'm not using any of this stuff for like planning my hunt as far as e-scouting, but if I'm looking into yeah. a new area for, do I want to go hunt this unit this year, or is it a good or a bad year? Helpful. Um, you know, precipitation radar, CWD, smoke forecast is also another interesting one before you come out. Uh, we definitely aren't, you know, we don't have time, nor do we, do we need to dive into each one of these, but I want to at least highlight on, on some of the, the more yes. marquee ones. Wilderness area, I don't know the Idaho rules and regulations on wilderness because I've never hunted it. Wyoming, for example, you cannot hunt wilderness area without a resident that's gone through the proper steps or a, a licensed guide. So 
wilderness area is helpful for that, but also helpful for if you can hunt it, it's good to know that there's not going to be uh, roads and trails and that type of thing through the country. So not finding any readily available on the map, but wilderness area will will show you the outlines and uh, just let you know, no motorized use. If you want to do a backpack hunt, it's a great place to start. Um, there's not going to be, yeah. there shouldn't be, legally there shouldn't be dirt bikes ripping through a wilderness area. So if you're going to go backpack hunt, that's a cool place to look. This one here I find wildly helpful. Um, slope angle, it's relatively new, underutilized. It might look like uh, you just spilled a bunch of color paint on your map for a second, but if once you know what you're looking for, it's really helpful. In the top right here, you can see what this is going to do. It's going to show you slope angle. So the green areas from like 5 to 10-ish degrees, and then you start to get to more of a yellow from like 15 degrees all the way to the super steep, basically cliff country is like blue. If you struggle with reading a topo map, which I would strongly urge everybody to get good at reading topo, it's more helpful than any aerial imagery map there is out there. Like if you could only give me one map, topo is for sure the way to go, right? Um, yeah. Aerial is super helpful, but Topo is going to be what you need overall. So a lot of people aren't super familiar with reading Topo. If you live in a flat state and you're going to go hunt Colorado at 10,000 feet, it's like, what, are, what is this on my map? It doesn't fully make sense. If you turn on slope angle with Topo, it really helps start to paint a bigger picture. So when you turn on slope angle and you see, okay, the purple and the blue are 40 to 45 plus degrees, that's super steep. Now I can start to understand, okay, so it's steep up in here and then it levels out a little bit. There's even some green and you know white, which is indicating below five degrees. So that's like flat, flat stuff. Yeah. So if I am, am looking at this and you know this blue might be a little too steep for uh, bedding country, but you get down in here and then, okay, so down in this country, if I flip on satellite and look, not much for water down in there. It's pretty rocky, but this whole flat area looks like it's going to hold water. So there's a lot of insight that you can gleam from, from looking at this. And then the slope angle is just kind of a, again, a really cool thing to help understand topo and hiking routes too. I have, I have hiked out, you know, either packing out an elk or just finding a, a way to get out in the dark where it is like atrocious. You're, you're cliffed out. It's not fun. You're looking with your headlamp and trying to find, you know, the next best spot. If you turn this on and follow like this ridge system here, if I was on top of this ridge and I wanted to get down off of it, right? And it was in the pitch dark, I couldn't see anything but what my headlamp can show. I'm going to use this ridge system and then find the best spot to get down within reason, obviously. Um, but if I'm over in this country, for example, instead of going straight down, I'm going to go to this area right here, find this ridge system. And yeah, there's going to be some red throughout here. But if you really look at it comparatively to everything else, um, you know, again, that's super steep, but this is going to be a better option. And without this layer turned on, it might not be as apparent, right? I have, a, I have 3D turned up a little bit, so I'm going to turn that back down just because we're in some pretty nasty country here. But it's not going to be quite as apparent if I turn it on. It's like, okay, that ridge system is actually a lot better. So slope angle is super helpful for that, for finding bedding areas. Um, and just a lot of different stuff. And it's one of those things that once you use it, you start to figure out how to use it more effectively. And then it kind of just snowballs into other areas of, of the hunt. I'm a big yellow, yellow fan, big yellow fan. You know what? No, we always, we always say that. There would be some guy in the group that, yep, we're on contour. Yeah, we're, we're, we're right on contour, you know. On contour. I've heard that a few times on a few bear pack outs. Pack outs. Yeah, yeah, yes, you ex have. Except yeah. when I heard on contour trend, we were going straight up the mountain, and it was not. It on, was, not yeah, on. straight up and down, straight up and down. All right, so we found that all this is, like, super, super awesome information and super helpful. Um, so, and, and I want to kind of reiterate what, Dylan was saying there, as far as that yellow stuff, um, he mentioned it just for a second, like, oh, wow, it looks like there could be a bench right there, you know? And I wanna kind of reiterate stuff like that, like finding elk, elk have just a few things that they need. They need, you know, they need cover, they need food, and they need some water. And 
they like the open spots just as much as they like the thick spots. They like, you know, especially in the, in the month of September because they like those openings and watching their herds and seeing their cows and stuff like that. Talk us in as far as like finding, okay, I found a spot. I don't know if you can find somewhere on there, uh, wherever you're at there. Kind of, kind of walk, walk someone through like what you're looking for when you're seeing that right there. Go ahead. Perfect. The only other thing I'm going to, before jumping to that, just real quick, briefly, just a couple more layers. Make sure you have turn on trails, trail slope, uh, MVUM layer, roadless layer. Just go through layers and turn them on, turn them off. Make sure it's what you want. So, like, when you turn this layer on, for example, it's like, okay, I know there's roads there. Turn it on now, the roads really pop. So, for access and all of that good stuff, is this a dirt bike trail? Should I waste my time hiking in there so dirt bikes can drive right by me on mile five, et cetera? Turn those on. Click on them, find out the info. I'm sure there's some elk in these drainages, right? Gotta be. We're just gonna blow up somebody's spot, but you know. It, you know. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna caveat this with, uh, I've never been here. Trent's never been here. We have no intention of never been here. And apologize if, uh, if we happen to cover anybody's spot here. But um, there's not much timber in this spot, so I'm gonna find something close by that maybe has a little bit more. Although I'm sure there's so elk you're gonna, that. There's elk that so you're gonna start there. with you're going to start with um, satellite maps, right? You're going to start with the whole the whole gamut. You're not just going to go topo. You're not. You're going to go satellite just so you can see timber. You can see all these kind of things. Correct. Correct. Yep. Yep. I'm going to go with satellite, or what I might go with is, and really it's just personal preference. Right now I'm on hybrid, so you have satellite, hybrid, topo. Hybrid's going to show you the satellite plus topo, and the the really big benefit to hybrid as well, and the reason that I personally use it more is when you go just straight satellite yes you get a much better view of the ground but what you don't get is the the streams and the water right so when you turn on hybrid okay. or if you turn on topo you can see the blue so that's you know probably a creek down in here and then some tributaries it's not always a hundred percent just because on the map it shows blue up in a high drainage or a spring it does not mean it's 100% going to be flowing or have the amount of water that you want, but it's a really good starting point of if I know I'm, if I'm in this drainage, if I am to find water, it's going to more than likely be in one of these spots, right? Now I might hike through yeah. two of these and not see water, um, but Beaver Creek down here in the bottom probably has some water. That one's a little bit more of a, a main creek that starts at the head and everything flows into it. So you can bet down in this country, Beaver Creek's gonna hold some water. So I like the hybrid just so I can also be looking for water at the same time. Yeah, no, we've had that a couple different times where it's just like, it says there's water there, but you have to walk an extra 100 feet and then you find, you know, water or something. It's, I mean, it's, it's pretty darn accurate though. So, I mean, again, we can just zoom in here and uh, is there anything in particular, Trent, you want to look at? What we would normally do is we're trying to get off of a road, right? We're trying to get away from a road, trying to get, you know, and, and that can be anything. And that's what I really want to reiterate to people as far as you don't have to be 10 miles in to find elk. You just, you, you don't have to. Go to your physical ability and, and see what, you know, test yourself with what that is before season gets here and be like, okay, I can easily go in five miles and if I'm going to bivy hunt or if I'm going to make a circle and come out to a spike camp, have all those things in mind before you actually just get there and go, all right, this is where I said I'm going to hunt. Now where am I going to go? So with Onyx, yep. I would like you to show them like, okay, here's the nearest road and this is where I want to go. I can actually, you know, make a track or whatever. Could you, could you kind of briefly go through that, like where you might go into? Yep. So looking at it, I've got a road system down here. I also have a, what looks to be like a main highway um, up here, but if you really zoom in and look, so this is Locksaw River. Um, I've driven that highway. I know what that's like. Um, there are ways to get across that river, but that just having a river on the south side of that highway is going to really impede a lot of people from getting into this country effectively, right? So that's yep. different than the, if the river was on the north side of the highway. I would think about this section right here, this area differently. That's a river that you're not gonna probably be able to wade across. You might need a raft to cross. Wouldn't be a huge deal. It would take you 20 extra minutes, right? But it is an extra barrier. So take those kind of little things like that into consideration. So I'm just gonna say this area right here is what I'm interested in, right? Okay. Pretty close to a wilderness. So here's a cellway. 
Um, here's a wilderness right here. This is an accessible road. I'm going to confirm that by clicking on it. I'm going to scroll down. It is overland high clearance. And here's the open dates. We'll say it's accessible all year. I can get up to this lookout at least. From this lookout, this is a trail. So if I go back to my layers and go to roads and trails, if I turn that off, this is why it's so important to have the right layers turned on. Yeah. Now you look at this and it's like, okay, that is going to be a very, very intensive. Um, I'm going to go ahead and draw a line from here. Say I want to get from there over to there. Well, that's 3.6 miles as a crow flies across country, which is some pretty nasty country. Um, yeah, I guess. Again, topo. Now I can zoom in and see like, okay, what kind of elevation gain and loss. But I'm going to go back and turn on the correct layers so I know that there are trail systems that run through there. So that's going to save me a lot of time. Uh, same thing with the trail slope and the mileage. So tra trail slope is just going to give you kind of the same thing as that slope angle. Anywhere it's red is going to be steep. Green is easy, steep is red. So I'm just going to start by dropping a waypoint in an area that I, that I like. So let's just say off of, for ease here, Sheep Hill. This is an area that is interesting to me. At first glance, it's got some good benches, some good ridge systems um, down through here, and then it breaks down even more into here. So I'm just going to go ahead and throw a waypoint as a, a rough starting point. So I'm going to go up here, hit waypoint, and drag that to right there. Could be a potential camp spot, right? So sure. you're close yeah. to the trail, but you're, you're definitely off of it. And if that trail isn't getting a lot of uh, day hikers, et cetera, it's not going to be too bad. So I'm going to go ahead and label this camp. So now one of my thoughts is how extensive is it to get from where I can drive to, to the potential camp spot or a spot that I want to go hike into and, and put some boots on the ground and scout. I'm going to go... We'll just do truck on this one, change the color so it's different. And while he's doing this too, guys, like we've always said this, and this is kind of a, I don't know, it's kind of a, a main staple with us. Waypoints are free is what we call them. So you can put on as many as you want. I mean, Trevor, he'll find a mouse turd and he'll waypoint it. You know, he, he's got 14,000 waypoints on just, just Oregon alone pretty much. But it's, it's nice to where you just go buy a wallow and it's like, it takes two seconds to wallow, you know, put it as a waypoint. Hey, this is, you know, this is a wallow. It'll actually paint a way better picture for you when you get there uh, to kind of just narrow it down. So what you used to have to do, I'm just gonna brag on this new feature real quick because I think it's wildly helpful. What you used to have to do with something like this is start here and click your way all the way down this trail, right? So. You know, you could zoom in, get it as granular, or if you're in a hurry, whatever. Do that. You do not have to do that anymore. You can go ahead, discard. So this new tool called Build Route, Route Builder, I'm going to do Snap 2. This works on roads and trails. Um, so I'm going to start here where that waypoint is. And you can see that anywhere I drag my mouse, even if it's up in here, it's going to snap to the nearest trail. So if I want to end up over in here where my mouse is, now I know that there's a better route to drive back down around this way and come in from that way, right? So that's so cool. It's it's saved so much time, and even for driving from point A to B, it's just a really really yes. cool feature. So it's only going to work to the trail, but I know, you know, I can zoom in, and that's going to be pretty close. So I'm going to go ahead and save it. Um, but first, I'll show you at a glance. This will show me. I'm going to start at 68.87 for feet. And then as I go, if you look at the map, it'll show you the distance and then the elevation of where you're at on that point at the map. So I'm going to basically be hiking downhill, get to like a saddle, climb back uphill a little bit, and then drop some more vert. So I'm going to get all the way down to 5,000 feet. Um, and then I'm going to climb back up a little bit, end up, let's see, 5349. So the, take that into consideration too, right? If you are dropping 2,000 feet to go put your camp in and you have three tags and you feel you're feeling lucky like you're going to shoot multiple bulls you're going to have to you know hike those all the way back up to the truck or find an alternative route to go around and you know hike them down to the bottom and find a road or something etc right from here everybody's going to have like a different train of thought and i'll be curious trent to pick your brain on yours but mine is usually yeah. first like where do i think the elk are going to be and this is super high level and how can i 
access and traverse through the country the most effective and meaningful way possible without like burning myself on day one. If you've got five days and you're going to go for a marathon, John, on day one, like you might hear bulls finally on day four, but you're too beat to, to get over there. Right. So um, that's what kind of what I'm looking for. Sure. What's what's the, kind of the first thing you look for? So so my big my big things on that is kind of planning my route and saying, OK, I'm going to hit these, you know, these basins. I'm going to probably not go clear to the top of the mountain. Obviously, I'm going to stay side hill. Um, another big tip for a lot of people is, you know, I, our camp is up on a ridge. You can tell how it's up. So I'm going to be able to hear bugles at night from either side. A lot of people will make the state mistake of just going up a trail and usually trailheads um, that go through the bottoms. You know, they go right through the creek. The creeks are loud. You're not going to be able to hear as well at night for um, bugles and stuff like that. And so you can chase something on daylight. So that's another little tip. Um, but honestly, Dylan, what I'm looking for is like a pretty good route. And then you said it a little bit already. I'm going to be looking for places I can get water so I don't have to pack another eight pounds of water on my back as I go through the day. So I can look at, all right, I can make it you know, two miles from here to here with the water I have, and then there's a creek that I'm going to cross, and then I'll be able to fill up again, and so I can restore and re. You know, that that's kind of what I look for. And we, we also, I also try to, if I have a base camp kind of situation and I'm not full bivy hunting, I'm going to look for a circle, like a circle that I can make that's not going to be super, super uh, back breaking and and straight up and down kind of thing, and that way it kind of ends me up somewhere you never can tell what's going to happen you could chase a bull clear in the back end for you know until dark and then have that traverse all the way home so that that's what i look for dylan perfect no i completely agree but let's just say for all intents and purposes this is where we are camping one of the things i always do is i go to um i clicked on the wrong one here so I like to map out the ridge systems and just super potential. Here is easier ways to traverse this country. So if you look at the, the white dotted line here, that is a ridge system. Yeah, you're going to lose some elevation when you climb down there, but that's going to be the best route to go hunt and check out new country. Maybe sound check it as you're going. See if you can get a response from a bull down below you. Instead of dropping a bunch of elevation, I'm going to use that ridge system to be more effective, cover country, and then hiking back up to camp is going to be a lot easier than if you find yourself down in here and have to pull straight up out of the bottom. Obviously, if a bull's bugling down there, that's what you came for. Um, you're going to chase him to the bottom and then come up top, and then he'll be up top or bugle from the bottom again once you get up top. I do, again, is just go in line color. I'm going to undo this one and then start another one. So I might do this a handful of times, just wherever it really makes sense. Free draw, that's what I'm looking for. So another kind of a ridge system down in here. If I get down here in this country, to me, this looks pretty good uh, just because it spurs out mm -hmm. quite a bit. So if I, you know, drop off camp, get down here. Well, now you got a lot of like nooks and crannies and looks like some some feed, definitely some feed over in this country. And what you can do is just kind of bounce back between satellite and topo. They all kind of have their place. Try not to get stuck too much on one of them or the other. But again, there's some north facing stuff here. It benches out pretty nice. Like these little benches in here look pretty good. You know, down in here, if a bull bugled below me midday and I was up in here, I would really point to some of these benches and be like, there's a good chance they're, you know, sitting, laying up in here with their herd or over in here. Um, so what you guys are seeing Dylan do, I mean, you're looking at probably what he's in it, I don't know, 2,700 feet elevation drop, probably, I would say somewhere in there. And yep. maybe you're watching this and saying, that's crazy. I would never pack an elk out of that. Well, what you can do with these features and everything, you can say, okay, there's a trailhead right there. I can call the nearest outfitter and say, hey, is there any way that you would pack meat for me if I kill one down in here? And so you don't have to pack that elk all the way to the top of that trailhead. All you have to do is get it to a trail, which is normally in the bottom. We've had a couple different times where we killed elk way back in, and all we had to do is pack it down the hill 300 yards and hang it in a tree and an outfitter came and got it for us. So there's a ton of different options that anybody can, like it, don't, it doesn't mean that you just you know, have to do everything on your own. Use, use the ability to, to use these trails and to make these phone calls and to maybe make something way easier for you. That's a, that's a elk hunting cheat code right there. Uh, the other thing I wanna show is view shed for glassing. That's pretty, yes. This is a rifle hunter's 
Well, even Bo too, but Rifle Even Bo. Well. So I've talked to a few people that use uh, ViewShed quite a bit for seeing where they can like potentially hear bugles. It's interesting, you know, if you're on one side of the ridge and you can't hear anything, you pop up on a ridge and a bull's screaming 200 yards away. It's like, how didn't I hear him the whole time? But it's like a directional yeah. sound, like where you can sound check into areas. So essentially what uh, ViewShed does, it'll show you based on the topography what you can and can't see. So if you're up here high on the ridge, Everything that's highlighted, I should be able to see based on the topography. Now, if you notice like this area down in here, when I go back to the ridge is grayed out. So the topography, that ridge system is going to hide that area for me, right? Yeah. So for glassing, this is super helpful. Or like if you're on this side of the ridge and you sound check anything in that head end basin probably is going to hear you. But if you bounce over to the other side, there's a good chance, you know, it might not. You can kind yeah. of use it. It's not intended for that but you can kind of see where you could use it a little bit for i want to sound check that or look and be like man i've beagled my way up that drainage several years in a row but i've never been able to hit that pocket or something so you can use this tool to help out that's a great point really good point and so that's really terrain x in a nutshell and that you know the the whole idea behind this tool is to help you find northern facing slopes you know the things you read about in magazines right you need a northern facing bench um, close to water and good food, right? Man, I, I think we covered a lot of what we need to cover, buddy. And just now, like anything else like that you key in off of and that you would just kind of say, hey, I would, I would look into this or I would look into that. You know, for me personally, it's, uh, it's using what I know is working. So if I was to go hunt this area, I would make a much more elaborate, like here's water, here's potential bedding areas. Um, I'll show just a little bit of that. Um, so like, if I really like this area for bedding, we, we kind of pointed out a little bit of why there's a lot of potential benches down in here, some pockets, like a whole big long bench system here. I just think this area looks pretty good for bedding. What I might do, excuse me, is I might go to this area shape tool and say, okay, um, I can go in here later and really make this more pronounced if I, if I want to or like change it up a bit. But if I like this area, what I'm going to do is start marking stuff out on the map like this. Um, so that's relatively north, northeastern facing. Um, I might change the color. You know, the, my, my whole hunt plans, like plan A might be blue, right? And so I can sort and filter by what I want to see. Um, I That's probably cool. wouldn't quite do it that way. Just, just so I'd use like blue for water and et cetera, et cetera, and then drop them into folders, but you can change the color. You can customize it any way that makes sense in your mind that works. Um, but if I do all of my bedding areas like this blue and I e-scout multiple plans and I bounce back and forth, well, now I, on a high level, I'm like, yep, camp travel routes are all kind of the same white dotted lines. I can make them a little bit more, um, you know, change the weight of them. So they're not so popping out on the map like that so now all my potential travel routes are one thing my bedding areas are another my waypoints are for water swallow etc and i would go ahead and i'd build out this whole plan and strategy and this might be i probably wouldn't label it a yet um, i would do it for multiple areas and then figure out what i like the best and that would be my plan a and then i would pick my second one as a plan b third one as a plan c etc and I'd have three to four to five different options for this unit that I'm going to. And the other thing is I would probably not intentionally put plan A and plan B on complete opposite ends of the unit, right? I have a plan A, plan B might be pretty close to it. So if you need to pull out a mile or if you're just day hunting it or pick up truck camping, you know, you can check that or drive over three miles to that other area at night and sit there and listen for bugles for two hours in the dark. If your plan A didn't have any bugles the first morning you, or the first day you spent in it, and you're truck camping, you drive over you know, two miles and you sit and listen, and four bulls are screaming below you, well, plan B is all of a sudden your new plan A, and now you've already got yeah. your strategy figured out for it. You've got a camp icon, you know, some potential spots. You've got bedding. So that way, if you get there and bulls are bugling, and it's 1030 the next day and you're chasing bugles, you can pull up your map and say, Man, there's, I, I marked out three betting options over there and the way that bull is headed, it really seems like he might go there. He may end up in that spot, maybe not, but you at least have something to work off of. So 
I would plan out several different plans and options, and then I would put them in a folder system to where if I'm going to go hunt with Trent, I can send him, here's a folder for everything in plan A that I e-scouted. Maybe Trent's going to do the same thing, and then we're going to compare notes, and Trent's going to say, no, I don't like the spot because of this, and bring up things that you know I wasn't thinking of and vice versa. But I can share all of that content with Trent and anybody else we're meeting um, so they have all of this information and uh, intel right on their phone. phone. Perfect. I, couldn't, I could not stress that enough to people, what he just said. Pick a few spots, guys. I've heard so many times guys say, I spent my whole 10 days off work and I didn't find an elk. And I said, well, did you try different spots? He goes, no. They were there the year before, or they, you know, whatever it may be, or, you know, or I, my buddy went there and said it was loaded with elk, and I just couldn't find an elk. If elk are big animals, if they're not there, you are not going to see them. You know, if they're around, you're going to see them. They leave sign, they leave all sorts of uh, stuff when, they're, when it's in the breeding season. So just, and, and my rule of thumb is if we can't find an elk, or where we want as much elk sign as we're looking for in three days, we're going to bail. And I would even nail that down to two days even, I would say. So one thing I do want to say is there's so many more features, guys. It's, I mean, you've got the rifle feature, you've got features where you can track, you know, exactly where you shot. Obviously, you know, we're talking archery elk a little bit right now, but I mean, there's just so many more features that, that Dylan didn't get into that down the road, we'll do some more videos and and we'll talk maybe we'll do a whole rifle segment or something that would be kind of fun but um no uh a couple things that just uh, big takeaways for me uh while we're while we're ending here is use all the free things available with the elites you know sign up for elite you've got hunt and fool you've got uh access to the born and raised gear shop you're going to need that for elk calls okay just a little uh plug there <laughs> anyway and Another thing I noticed that you did the whole time there is you really, really played with all the layers. You were constantly back to the layers, back to the layers, back to, and that, that, that definitely makes more sense as far as, and I, I learned some things. There's some things in there that I don't do that I need to start looking into as well. And last but not least, guys, the big thing for me is like scouting is part of hunting. You draw a tag in, a, in, a, in an area you don't hunt just when you get there and put your boots on the ground. You're hunting from the day you draw that tag to the day that you kill that elk. So that is part of the hunt and make it part of the hunt. Talk to your buddies. Like Dylan was saying, make a folder, share it with your buddy that you're going with and say, hey, what do you think of this? I've really dove into this. I mean, make it fun. Make it, make it to where it's just like this big enjoyable thing all season long rather than just in the, just in the month of September. So that's yeah, all I, I got, it. brother. And uh, like you said, make it fun. It's part of the process and um, nothing is, well, there's more rewarding things when you get that elk on the ground, you're, you're cutting meat, but it's super rewarding when you plan out an East Cotton area and drop waypoints. You're like, this looks good. It feels good. And you get there and there's elk there. And it's like just super yeah. rewarding. It's nice when yeah. uh, you've got a hot tip and somebody's like, Hey, there's a bunch of bulls in this drainage, whatever. Most people don't have that. Right. So Make it a uh, you know, make it fun. Everybody's got their own stuff, and then figure out who's the best person at it. You know, exactly, exactly. Well, thank you so much, Dylan. I really, really appreciate this, brother.